I'm sitting here between two of my very favourite writers, contemporary writers, and I think great writers, and I think you will know this as soon as you open um, page one, or maybe page two, other books, I think you know it instantly. And um, so it's a great privilege and pleasure to be here. And this discussion about modernism, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm now getting quite old, and we've been having this discussion recurringly over my lifetime. And one of the accusations has always been that the British, ever since James Joyce and Virginia Woolf, no longer do modernism. Whereas the French, the Italians, the Latin Americans all do do modernism. I'm not sure what that means. And maybe in the course of this discussion, we'll, we'll begin to understand what we might or might not mean by that. We're going to start um, with short, I think, commented readings. Readings with comment. Um, by our two guests. And first of all, we'll self we're reversing the gender order today. Um, we'll, what is modernism? Is it literary? Is it historical? Is it you? Eases out the old blade. 
you're more likely to cut yourself doing this, he thinks, as he bends to fiddle a bit of toilet paper from the wonky roller, than shaving. Okay, so that's the beginning of <coughs> this novel shark. And what can I say about it? Um, you may have noticed that in common with the high modernists, the passage incorporates direct thought, reported thought, sound, external, uh, memory. There's no actual external dialogue in that passage, but if there were, it would also be incorporated into the same line. And yes, I'm not keen on what Jimmy J called perverted commas. Uh, I don't like to uh, use them for speech, or at any rate, since I've shifted into this particular way of writing. Um, you may also have caught the reference to Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon, uh, or you may not. Um, I just put that into blind critics up, actually. I put quite a lot of things into my books nowadays that I've started using some of the techniques of the modernists uh, just to wind critics up. Why? And this is basically what I have to say to you. If you are a writer and you write books about books, you're a pretty shit writer. <laughs> but your critic can't write books, can't write fiction. Usually, some do, but majority don't. And the critic has spent all of her or his life sitting there reading books, and it's professional closure. So they can't really look at the text except <coughs> the textuality. They've forgotten that books are actually about the world. Uh, so they tend to think books are about other books, because they've been studying them for so long, they've got really confused. So if you just put a couple of little references to the modernists in your book, then they think that the reason why you're using these techniques in your novel is because you've been really influenced by George, or you've been really influenced by Elliot, or you've been really influenced by Jimmy Wolf, or whatever the fuck it is. Uh, and it's just bollocks. You know, because, you know, the reason why I decided to write in the continuous present, the reason why I decided to abandon an omniscient narrator, uh, and the reason why I decided to integrate dialogue, thought, everything else into a single unbroken line of prose, is because that's what life is like. My life is always now. It's not then. Will didn't sit at King's college talking to a group of people. I'm doing it right now. It's always now, okay? When people speak to me, they don't have quotation marks around what they say. I often find it difficult to distinguish between interiority and exteriority. I expect you do as well. You're probably wishing that I was a figment of your imagination. Perhaps I am. <laughs> so all of these responses to the problem of how to write about the world, not about other texts, are emotional responses. Because the reasons we write are emotional reasons. They're not intellectual reasons. You sit there and think, I'm going to do a piece of writing because of this idea or that idea. It's going to be a shit piece of writing. Yeah. The reason we write, the reason we want to be writers is because we feel and we want to articulate our feelings. So my reasons for taking up these techniques is I think they're better than a third person narrator. I think they're better than the simple past or any other tense for that matter. I think the whole kind of diacritical apparatus of uh, the 19th century so-called naturalistic novelist is pretty redundant. And I think it was redundant in 1914 when Jimmy J sat down to write Ulysses. And it's still redundant now. And I also slightly, you know, all writing now is modernist, actually, because that's the literary era we're living in. It didn't end. It hasn't ended. It's still going on. 
is a living tradition. Its inception comes in the late 19th century as a response to massive technological changes. Joyce and Ulysses is registering the impact of Einstein's second paper on special relativity. The movements of Stephen Deemless and Leopold Bloom around Dublin and the preoccupation in that novel, it's not really a novel, book, uh, with the notion of the parallax uh, is because Joyce understood the implications of relativity for perception of space time. I mean, not that I'm not perfectly concrete, but I don't think even Hume really understands the implications of the use of space time and friction. So, modernism is a creative response to really important changes in science, in technology, in communication. Again, back to Ulysses, the gramophone that Bloom imagines being implanted in the graves so that you can hear your great grandfather talking, or his description of the trams. This is a, an apprehension of the major, major changes, not just physical, but psychic, that are underway. You know what? Those changes are still going on. They haven't gone away. How else are we to register the inception of bidirectional digital media, the web and the internet, if not with a prose or with an artistic response that is appreciates their imminence in our culture? So postmodernism is something that happens in architecture and it's discreditable. Okay, it's the adaptation of details from previous forms and sticking them on facades and gussying up buildings because architects have run out of imagination. And it's the same with postmodernism in any other artistic era. R.N. Adams, the critic, said postmodernism has to be quick. Has to be quick. Has to be quick, postmodernism, because modernism has only lasted like. 35 years, and here comes postmodernism. What's that really about? Every other major aesthetic era in Western civilization has lasted around 500 years. <laughs> How come modernism only gets 30 or 40? That's got to be bollocks, right? <laughs> postmodernism is like marketing. It's like marketing. It doesn't mean anything. Don't pay any attention to it. It's nonsense. An absolute nonsense. If something tells me you're a postmodernist, I should leave. <laughs> <laughs> because they don't know shit from China. Because modernism is still going on. Yes, I am one of those people who believe that, particularly in the English literary world, there has been a retiring from what modernism asks of us. And why do I think in English? speaking world has been such a turning away from it. Imperialism, in a nutshell. It's all part of the kind of biscuit tin, all God bless the Queen, all let's get our red jackets and our busbies on. It's all part of that, let's invade Iraq again. So just so we can get a little kind of hard on for our kind of status in the world. And the rejection of modernism is all part of that. Jimmy Jay understood that the British Empire was finished, even though he took a pension from it. Good on him, I um, But everybody else who clings to the idea of this right tight little island punching above its weight on the international stage likes to revive Victorian novel forms and literary forms because it makes them feel comfortable in tradition and all of those things. And it's just not well, about the Americans. <coughs> I don't know what about the Americans. I think that they probably are uh, participating in that imperial project as well. Modernism doesn't sit well with imperialism. It's not by nature an invasive form. It's a form that registers change. It's not a propagandizing form in that sense. I would argue, and I'd be interested to see what anybody else has to say about it. The modernism is the true naturalism. That's pretty much what I have to say. Can I, can I, that, that puts down a lot of things for future questions, but can I just ask you one more? All right. Now, um, actually, it's a privilege. Um, I want to hear a little bit about how you sat down to write Umbrella and um, Shark, because it seems to me that the 
process in which you sit down and write a book, which is all one long sentence, or perhaps seven or several paragraphs, um, and the process with which the human voice is registered on the page, translated through you somehow the page, is perhaps different than it might be um, when you're writing what you call a natural story. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I mean, the minute you introduce perverted commas, and the minute you hit return, and the minute you hit attack to inject, then actually you are imposing a formal property on the idea of representing consciousness that is kind of alien to it. <laughs> I mean, if you look at kind of what I notice when I, when I go back to reading novels that are, or texts that are not registered in the impact of these modernist conventions, and of course they are conventions just like any other, is that there is something uh, very stale about the dialogue. I kind of can't really believe in it. You notice how in novels nobody ever talks over each other. <laughs> they always speak in discreet statements. If you notice how in the bulk of novels most of the characters, you know, the set of choices, he, uh, he forced the reader into the bedroom and the bathroom, and the reader then ran screaming out again. So, well, you know, I still, on rare occasions where I read contemporary fiction, nobody takes a shit, nobody wanks, nobody, you know, no, really, it really doesn't happen that much. I mean, still, most fictional characters still seem to have no genitals and to be mostly concerned with weighty philosophic issues or emotional issues in a rather kind of prosy way. And I think something about writing an unbroken line brings you these are the, the reality, the, the reality of phenomenal, what we must call phenomenology, the nature of consciousness in that way. And what I find is, again, abandoning that, you know, paratextual apparatus does bring me, I find it much easier to write voice. It's as simple as that. You wrote Zach. Listen, before you yes. engaged in this particular form of and and was he transformed by by you using this different kind of voice? Yeah, I think I mean I started to know what he was thinking. I mean, I've had him as a character in several other narratives. But I wrote a kind of bridge point book called Walking to Hollywood a few years ago that sort of and you know, in the past, I, I mean I think that I felt that I was registering modernism to some extent, but registering more in my subject matter than in the formal aspects of the way I wrote. And when I got to this book, Walking to Hollywood, I, I, I realized I'd reached the end of the line. Specifically, and I'm talking very specifically, and the thing I want to say to any of you guys who are going to enter this competition, stop thinking about modernism as something that happened in the 1920s. Stop thinking about it or in, in entering the competition uh, by reading some high modernist writer and then trying to do the same thing. Think about your own mind. It's now. Nobody's describing you objectively. There is no third person narrator in life. The third person narrator is a collective projection of the idea of God. That's what it is. God's the only person who sees everything everybody does and knows everybody's thoughts, like, like an impersonal narrator in a novel. And that's actually, I think that's why people labor under the delusion that artists are so important. Because, you know, it's a kind of magical thinking. There are these people who conjure up God. And it's why a lot of the kind of religiosity moved into art with the decline of established religion in the late 19th century. <laughs> okay, well, well, I have another question which I'll ask you later about does it make a difference that Zen is a psychiatrist or you're moving in a world of asylums and mm. madness, um, R.D. Lang's project and mm. so on, but we can leave that to one side and, and move on to Rachel, who I, I suspect well, so will now. I don't want to cry myself. Well, I mean, what I think what's very interesting is that I, I would call um, you a modernist writer as well in some respects. But of course the project is completely different yeah. from what Will is doing, and I think that's what's so interesting. I mean, what, one of the, for me, 
I mean, this is a true sort of um, phase of experience and the realization that, that, which is kind of like realizing people don't learn anything from history and that maybe you don't learn anything from your own experience. Um, that, that art is not progressive. Uh, I've sort of wrestled <laughs> with that. I, I mean, the majority of the contemporary writings that I read, student writings and published writings, um, they're written as though these texts had never existed, modernist, as though modernism had never happened. I mean, the Virginia Woolf said it was, you know, isn't it great? writing a modernist novel because you don't have to explain the history of lace making. So your novel can be 150 pages long rather than 500 pages long. Um, I mean, the, what Will was saying about omniscience, narrative, just narrative, whatever that is. Um, it was done away with and yet it's still here. It's like some sort of bind weed. Um, so I suppose I've come to, I mean, there's two different, for me, two different experiences of um, modernism, and one is as a reader and the other is as a writer, and they're really, really, really different. So I think as a young person, your encounters with the new, and for me this was art just as much as books, um, and it was music. Um, those are all things that are speaking to you very loudly in your village, in Suffolk, in your boarding school. You know, here's this amazing stuff, and you feel strange, and you feel different from other people, and, oh, you know, this is what it is, here's why. Um, finding that in, as a writer, has been a completely different um, process, and much more indexed to living. I suppose, I suppose I see the idea, I mean, Will said that modernism is a creative response to important changes. That's a very good way of putting it. But for me, that, that, that would be about life. <laughs> um, that, that actually all of my development as a writer has been a creative response to important changes. That's what it's been. It's been realizing that formative experience I mean, how do, how do we live, you know, in a kind of Jungian way? We're, we're born into a reality bequeathed to us by other people, and we spend 40 years either trying to stay in it and then smashing it up, or gradually smashing it up. Uh, and in writing, that's, I mean, I remember well, probably most of the things I've written, this sort of amazing frustration. What, why do I write like this? Why can't I? be something else. Um, and in the end, I've only managed to become something new as a writer by living things and then understanding the form that has to come out of the living of them. Um, and so I think that essentially, for me, probably is what modernism is. It's, it's something that happens in your own in the, in the story of a person, in the history of a person that's also happened in the history of the world. I mean, can you learn from your own history? Well, as an artist, it's, it's as well to try to do that. Um, I mean, I think form is the most interesting aspect of all of this. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I've taught creative writing for many years, too many years, and the thing that I, I just did Pretty randomly, that, that actually has had the most extraordinary effect of any, any teaching kind of trick I ever learned. Um, so there's a, a poem, I don't know if any of you know the poet Anne Carson, um, she's a very fantastic writer. And poetry really is, is, if you want a bit more of a razor's edge on these things, poetry is the place to look for it. Um, anyway, she's, she does very interesting things with form, and she wrote something called The Glass <coughs> Essay. Um, very long autobiographical book in poetic novel, prose in poetic form, um, and about herself, about her mother having was it her father and her son and herself and her own that story. And I 
instructed my students and instructed them repeatedly to write something in this form. And, and it's amazing what the form does to the student, how it liberates them, how it permits them, how it shows them what to do, and how it completely releases them from everything old and conventional and, and puts them in the driving seat of their writing persona. Um, so form is very powerful. When you find the right one, it's a very powerful thing. Um, so this novel uh, is the result of me probably thinking I would never write anything again. Because um, uh, I could not imagine how the various twists and turns that I come to in living, how I would ever find a form to describe that. Um, and in the end, I wrote a book about teaching, about a writer teaching a creative writing class, which doesn't sound very promising. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I sort of can't quite, uh, I had a way of describing this book that would have made it a bit clearer to you, but um, uh, anyway, I'll read a bit of it. So what's happening in this passage is that uh, the students have been set a assignment, which is to write a story involving an animal. Um, and they, so nobody writes anything in these creative writing classes. What they do is talk. And the whole book is about talking. Um, as, I mean, I suppose my version of what Will says, the, the, this form that he's found is, is his experience of existence and consciousness. Um, and for me, there's something very, something I've noticed because I suppose I've increasingly spent a lot of time just listening to people talk, uh, how much of reality is created by, um, just verbally, and that a lot of the desire to write is, I think, uh, a, a verbal a desire to talk Anyway, not for me, it's not, but for a lot of people, I think it is. So um, nobody writes anything, they just talk. Um, and this is the uh, contribution of, um, it's set in Athens, by the way. Um, uh, this is the contribution of a student called Sylvia. I hope it's not too long. Sylvia said she had written nothing at all. Her contribution yesterday, if I recalled, had, in fact, concerned an animal. The small white dog she had seen perched on the shoulder of the tall, dark man. But after the others had spoken, she wished she had chosen something more personal, something that would have allowed her to express an aspect of her own self, rather than a sight that was asking, as it were, to be seen. She had looked out for that man again on the train home, as it happened, feeling that she had something to say to him. She wanted to tell him to take the dog off his shoulder and let it walk, or better still, get a dog that was ordinary and ugly, so that people like her wouldn't feel so distracted from their own lives. She resented him for his attention-seeking behaviour and for the fact that he had made her feel so uninteresting. And now here she was, mentioning him in class for the second time. <clears throat> Sylvia had a small, pretty, anxious face and great quantities of ash-coloured hair worn in maidenly rolls and tresses, which she touched and patted frequently around her shoulders. In any case, she continued, she obviously didn't see him again on the way home because life wasn't like that. She returned to her apartment, which, since she lived alone, was exactly as she had left it that morning. The telephone rang. It was her mother, who always phones her at that time. How was school today, her mother wanted to know. Sylvia works as a teacher of English literature at a school in the suburbs of Athens. Her mother had forgotten she had the week off to do the writing course. I reminded her of what I'd been doing, Sylvia said. Of course, my mother is very sceptical about writing, so it's typical that she wouldn't remember. You should have gone on holiday instead, she said. You should have gone out to one of the islands with some friends. You should be living, she said, not spending more time thinking about books. To change the subject, I said to her, Mum, tell me something you've noticed today. It was the writing assignment they'd had the day before. What would I have noticed, she said. I spent all day in the house, waiting for the man to come and fix the washing machine. He never even turned up, she said. After our conversation, I went and looked at my computer. I had set my students an essay assignment, and the deadline had now passed. But when I checked my emails, I saw that not a single one of them had sent the essay. It was an essay about Sons and Lovers by D.H. Lawrence, the book that has inspired me more than anything else in my life, and none of them had a single word to say about it. 
I went and stood in my kitchen, she continued, and thought about trying to write a story. But all I could think of was a line describing the exact moment I was living in. A woman stood in her kitchen and thought about trying to write a story. The problem was that that line didn't connect to any other line. It hadn't come from anywhere, and it wasn't going anywhere either, any more than I was going anywhere by just standing in my kitchen. So I went to the other room and took a book off the shelf, a book of short stories by D.H. Lawrence. D.H. Lawrence is my favorite writer, she said. In fact, even though he's dead, in a way I think he's the person I love most in all the world. I would like to be a D.H. Lawrence character living in one of his novels. The people I meet don't even seem to have characters. And life seems so rich when I look at it through his eyes. Yet my own life very often appears sterile, like a bad patch of earth, as if nothing will grow there, however hard I try. The story I started to read, she said, was called The Wintry Peacock. It's an autobiographical story, she said, in which Lawrence is staying in a remote part of the English countryside in winter. And one day, when he's out on a walk, he hears an unusual sound and discovers that it's a peacock trapped out on the hillside, submerged in the snow. He returns the bird to its owner, a strange woman at a nearby farm who's waiting for her husband to return home from the war. At this point, she said, I stopped reading. For the first time, I felt that Lawrence was going to fail to transport me out of my own life. Perhaps it was the snow, or the strangeness of the woman, or the peacock itself. But suddenly I felt that these events and the world he described had nothing to do with me here in my modern flat in the heat of Athens. For some reason I couldn't bear it any longer, the feeling that I was a helpless passion passenger of his vision. So I closed the book, she said, and I went to bed. Wonderful. Um, let, let me pose a couple of questions directly to you. I mean, it, the structure of this book, I know one is not meant but I found the structure of this book absolutely fascinating because, in fact, there is there's a kind of absent presence of the teacher character and the uh, her teaching is actually a way to the lives and the stories, if you like, of all the others. And so, so it, it sort of goes on. And then I read somewhere that um, you'd said, and I'm going to quote you to you, that autobiography, this is, I think, after you'd written your memoir, um, Autobiography is increasingly the only form in all the arts. Description and character are dead or dying in reality as well as in art. And I, I somehow wanted you to try and tie up what you've done with this uh, woman who's reading D.H. Lawrence and then stops and your central narrator in this and, and that statement. Is it something you still believe? I mean, do, do you think that autobiography is the only form that's left. We cannot create character well, because we don't have it. I mean, how uh, how can you progress uh, your? How can you progress any art form? Um, it, it's really, really difficult to tell the truth. It's really difficult to find a truthful form that is about uh, that isn't about the past, that isn't, um, as Will said, that isn't, you know, the indent and the quote marks and the, um, although some of those things, you know, those things still adhere to me, they, they, I've been so formed by them that, that I can't get rid of them. Um, so I think it's almost like you're looking for a sort of gap in the fence, you know, that, <laughs> a little way through and it's really, really, really hard to find it and increasingly I spend, I can spend two or three years thinking about form and two or three week, weeks, I wrote this book in three weeks. That's, once I've understood what I'm doing, writing is neither here nor there, it's, it's trying to find the thing that isn't a lie, I suppose. And and I think lots and lots of, I've watched lots of artists in different forms coming to that con same conclusion. Um, uh, I mean about uh, autobiography. Um, because, I mean, if, if you get to the point where you cannot write in all seriousness, John got up from the kitchen table and left the room. I mean, if you actually can't do that anymore, which 
basically I can't. And, and I think, again, it's like a midlife crisis. I think you reach a point where you just don't believe it anymore. You just can't believe it. And the only um, source of truth is yourself. That, that's where that inability to fantasize leaves you. Um, I'm sure there's another way which is to do with information, to do with knowledge, to do with con concrete things. Um, but I haven't found that way. I, I only found this uh, lack of, I can only find authenticity in my own experiences, I guess. I can only guarantee it. So, Will, how, how does that resonate with you? I mean, this, this is a kind of character is no longer possible. But yet, I go away as a reader from both these books, and I think they have very strong characters. I mean, you know, um, most of you know, your characters is an extraordinarily dense and, and lively character, yet he's made up of all these well, modern I should have said characters. Well, I agree. Well, I very much agree with Rachel, and I, I think that the thing that's amazing. The cyclical people are potentially going to be entering competition with you about their own writing. Uh, I want to say to you, you can have a midlife crisis at any age. You don't have to wait until middle age. And I, I completely agree with Rachel. I think we had the same thing happen to us. We found that we couldn't suspend disbelief. Yeah. Uh, not just in our own writing, but possibly in any writing at all, that was a real kind of problem. I found that simply getting rid of some of the conventions of, of fiction as it tends to be written now was enough. It actually just liberated me. I didn't. But I think I wrote this sort of transitional book where I was exploring what a kind of different style might be like, and then I kind of launched it out in that way. But it was a response to the same sort of problem. I don't think, though, that the, the, the ability of the novel to create a character uh, is imperiled. I think narrative is a different problem. Now, what do we mean by narrative? I mean, put boldly, narrative is just a succession of events. Right, fine. It's not actually what we mean. What we mean when we talk about narrative is, you know, stuff that makes you read all actually. So it's either a McGuffin or it's, it's some kind of incentive to kind of move through. And that's kind of not like life, right? Life doesn't have many incentives for you to go on living. No, not quite in that way. Maybe it does. Maybe narrative does in some sense correspond to ideas of wish fulfillment or the idea that, you know, we'll get the boy or we'll get the girl or Know, whatever it is. I slightly suspect that Rachel's um, desire in the character <coughs> is because you are what you eat when you're a writer. I mean, just to give you an example, a few years ago I wrote a gay novel. When I was writing a gay novel, I was gay. And as soon as, no, I was, I was gay. I was just gay. I was so gay. I even wrote an article in the paper saying, everybody's gay. <laughs> <laughs> we are gay. Why don't people get over this gay straight on? Everyone's gay. <laughs> and um, I published a novel, my friend John came back from all and said, everybody on the beach in Meganarts is reading your book. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, right, I've got a hit on my hands, what with everybody being gay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's like it's just going to clean up. Then the sales figures came in and it sold a fraction of my own books. And, and it's like, it's typical, we're, we're, we're bourgeois nucleists. I thought, oh no! Everybody is you guys. <laughs> I sort of came out of it again at uh, that point. So I thought that we all eat. When we're when mm -hmm. Pastor mm -hmm. Rachel has written this book, it has this conceit around the idea of uh, an absent but present character. At the moment she's doesn't believe in character. Look how bad it's actually. But I do think there is something going on with So you know, will next write a, a realist novel with a he and she and omniscient mm -hmm. novel. Yeah, no, but I mean, if one thing that's notable about these books, Umbrella and Sharp, is that they've got really strong narratives. They actually tell stories. Now, I don't think that uh, abandoning the convention of the third person writer or writing the continuous present, and I was 
very interested as we do reading and how uh, you dance the quadrille with your tenses mm. there rather than just say sorry I'll write you. No, no, no I've, I've fucked it up as well in certain places. I, I can't get it all out, but I, every time I look at it, I think I know. <laughs> it's so, it's so. I mean, they're difficult. all in there. There was the historic past, the continuous present, the blue perfect. I spotted them all. Uh, so, you know, and I thought, there's a woman in It was really fun. <laughs> but in a way, I understand what you're doing. You're trying to get to now, really, to, to this nowness. Uh, but I, I don't think that, that uh, the adopting these stratagems need that we cannot have the consolation of narrative or plot mm -hmm. at all. But it does mean that we need to think about plot in a different way and arrive at it in a different way. You know, one, the original modernists and the first modernists were very much responding to there were a counter enlightenment, enlightenment movement and they saw narrative as being part of the dominant uh, ideological construction. You know, Tony Blair would love narrative. Things can only get better. <laughs> you know, that's narrative that uh, Wolf and Joyce and, and Wyndham Lewis are assaulting. They're saying, no, 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 things can't only get better. Things may just go around again and be exactly the same. You know, so you have to kind of bury narrative, you have to introduce a sinuosity into that I think most kind of texts, you know, fiction texts just don't possess. What they mostly start with is a succession of events. And then they try and put into that succession of events something to keep people interested in. Well, I think maybe yeah. the wrong elements of, I mean, let's say that modernism, it's another way of looking at it, is a, a sort of democratic assertion that life has has form that there doesn't it doesn't need to be Judeo Christian form it doesn't you know narrative doesn't need to be a story that, that actually if you if you pay attention to every single person's experience there you find amazing degrees of form which is, is you know again my current obsession um, but to you giving us the amazingness of our individual person's experience and I would I would suggest that you have learned a great deal about writing by the doing of it um, yeah. and by the reading of it. And I, so it brings me back to this question of modernism. You say modernism is now. 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 <laughs> now. 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 now in the present tense. But I could say to you, I could turn around and say, that's a stylistic conceit. Um, and that, in fact, our minds are very inner stream is as much shaped by the kinds of books we read as it is by this, um, this conceit of the continuous present. So I may have an inner narrative which actually does work more like Van Zapp. I don't know, I'm not saying it does, but, but it might. And I may have, you know, reams of garbage about but making lace and paper. Yeah, I should see you read too many books. You read too many books written by people. So I put an after to see you. I don't believe, I think you and I could do a little table tennis about the books we've read, <laughs> and you'd win. <laughs> Actually, I think that's quite superficial. People do, in, when you talk to them, they may say, ooh, and then I met him at, at, at Paddington. It was an amazing coincidence, and we've been married for 42 years, and I love him. <laughs> but actually, it wasn't an amazing coincidence that they met in Paddington Station. Is this man in Paddington Station? <laughs> And, and she has retrospectively imposed a narrative construction on her experience in order to make sense of it and validate it. The reality is we just wander around bumping into things. Okay, I'm a, I, would, I would like to argue this, but I will not, because no, no. it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> and Rachel might want to argue it too. Please, questions from you about what's been said, but also about things that may not yet be said to do with modernism and writers that you think may or may not fall into that um, very large bracket. Come on, kids. <laughs> Good man. So, uh, the self-awareness in post-modernism. Could, could you stand and speak up? <coughs> Sorry, because it's, it's oh, here it comes, there is a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Writing, like we're still fighting aphorisms completely 
that that seems to think for that sort of re-consumeristic self-aware market culture we've got? Do you think that's why in South America as well? Do you think the Britain will stifle by that? Well, I think postmodernism is an attempt to smuggle uh, you know, pre-modernist attributes back into the novel. I mean, postmodern things look kind of funky and weird and different. But just like postmodern architecture, they're actually made up of things that have been borrowed from previous forms. So they're, they're kind of an attempt to get back to it. And yes, I agree with you. It's like marketing. This is kind of wacky and new. Maybe we can plug in new books. It's not, it's not a creative response to modernity. That's the problem. Modernity is, is still with us. And you know, people are not responding to it. They're actually failing to respond to it. <coughs> talking about is um, proliferation, really. And that is a... Uh, um, I, 
I mean, why is it that we're allowed to, um, I mean, being allowed to describe consciousness, for instance, uh, I think I used the word democracy before, or democratization, I mean, it's the same as all other, as other freedoms. Um, we're all allowed to do all sorts of things now that we, George Eliot wasn't allowed to do, and that includes write about the individual in a more, in a more honest way. Um, so I don't think it's so much to do with people changing as to do with freedom, rights, uh, less stuffiness. Um, it's really amazing that Lady Chatterley's lover could only be read in the 1960s. I was reading it the other day, and uh, I mean, that seems, so I suppose I think these things are still quite, um, they're sort of worth defending or worth remembering or something. Um, I mean, Tasha, there's a very different division between the public and the private. I mean, even from the high moment of Joyce to now, and what you can put into the public domain is completely different from what it was then. What, what was daring then cannot be daring now. I mean, oh, I'm sure that that could go well, backwards in an instant. One of the problems with the history of modernism is it's not confused, and I try to disagree with you, actually, it's not confused with, with this issue of the representation sexuality and mm. the, uh, the visceral aspects of human life. Because what one thing I have is after the Chatterley trial, what, you know, once it became acceptable to represent the reality of human sexuality and the embodiment, people thought modernism was over. They confused the battle for articulating those things in the public forum with the actual techniques of registering the impact of modernity in a broader sense. So, you know, people started to think, well, you know, I can look at porn on the internet, I don't need modernism. <laughs> no, 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 really, it's some kind of weird level, whereas in fact modernism is really about that exactly. It's about something. It's well, something no, but I think what, what, I mean, what I was trying to describe more was the, the um, cruelty of uh, the earlier <laughs> world. I guess. I mean, the cruelty of the Victorian world. Well, cruel to art and cruel to people. I, I'm and teaching some students uh, Wolves to the Lighthouse next week. And that's pretty print. I mean, she can't call a spade a spade in that book. There are, you know, she's meant to be writing about somebody's internal thoughts, but Mrs. Ramsey never actually says she's horny. <laughs> Even to herself, she can't say she wants a bar. Because these things are not articulated. What? These things are not articulated, well, even like, by the individual. No, it's like living under a Stalinist regime. You're worried about a thought crime. Right? <laughs> think about that. Mm -hmm. OK, time for two more questions, I think. Um, you can ask them both. <laughs> <laughs> One there first, and then you. Um, so we know you think of postmodernism. Uh, do you think late modernism is a, is a thing, a late modernist writer, and if so, how would you define that? Well, I think late modernist writers will be working in... I mean, you don't mean late modernist in the sense of late capitalism. In all kinds of... No. You mean a late period of modernism. Well, you have I to mean, is there, a, is there a mode of modernism that is reacting against certain techniques as displayed by high modernists like Joyce, like Wolf, um, that's actually doing something very different? I was thinking particularly in terms of dialogue uh, like a move back towards dialogue, for example, in Patrick Hamilton or someone like that. I just wanted to know what you had to say on late modernism. Patrick Hamilton? <laughs> yeah. What? Hangover Square? Slaves yeah. in solitude. Well, he's a modernist. I'm like... <laughs> I think I don't know who I am. Nick McManus, the restaurant, <laughs> World of Sports. <laughs> <laughs> you would say it. <laughs> I don't. Uh, no, I don't think like, my, my hunch is modernism will endure like all the other major So if you want to get back to me in kind of 24-14, But can't the two exist together? Well, no, I mean, it's sort of what Rachel said earlier on, and it's, you're, you're falling into what I call the critical fallacy, which is it's all about intertextuality. It's all about a response to what other artists have done. I think I said from the get-go, I write about the world, not about other books. So I'm not really reacting to modernism in quite that way. I want Rachel to take this up if she... Oh, 
wonder whether drama is a, is a more um, <clears throat> sort of fertile, has more examples of, of what you're talking about. It's the thoughts of Eugene O'Neill, sort of Arthur Miller. Um, that maybe that those that return to realism <coughs> in in the dramatic form. Um, uh, and then, you know, Raymond Carver. I mean, uh, da, da, da. I mean, to me, those, those things sort of lead to each other. Um, go on, go on. Yeah. Later, when Brad picked up the <laughs> and put it in the back of the pickup, I wondered why he shot Butch. Butch wasn't bothering anybody. He was just being, I mean, fuck that. <laughs> Anything that easy to parry. <laughs> okay, but, okay, think about um, well, but, but that's an interesting point because I think there is a kind of idea of modernism. You know, there's, there's the, the modernist plenty, which is effectively what you're talking about, which is the modernism of a kind of overflowing consciousness in which life comes in and out as a Yeah, and which has a lot to answer and for in terms of mediocrity of contemporary fiction. Uh, you know, modernism has left a you know, bad and, but legacy. But there is the other modernism, yeah, which is about people, minimalism. Absolutely ridiculous. The only people who are, who are to blame for powerless conditions of contemporary fiction are the swine and writers. <laughs> <laughs> you can't blame a kind of aesthetic movement for creating something. Um, Somebody has to actually pick up the pen and start <laughs> making the marks on their time. I don't think you don't look happy with this. <laughs> I think when I said... I was talking about late modernism not as a conscious, I'm going to react against other writers, but as a different way of processing the idea of consciousness as a reaction to the changes that you're talking about. Yeah. And what I mean is that in certain books, you see really distinct techniques where, is in other slightly later books, drastically different ones, both of which are coming under the kind of umbrella of modernism. And I was just asking whether you thought that late modernism was a valuable term in its own right. Well, I don't personally, but I understand what you're talking about, and it is a valid point. There have been other ways of responding to this problem of, of modernity. I mean, I think some of the, you know, there's some kind of uh, concrete poetry in prose is trying to respond to it, too, by a lot of writers like the late Gordon Byrne, who introduced a lot of media mm. into the form. So actually, Jimmy Jay did that from the get-go. So it's not that original, but you know. What about you know, Ballard? David Peace, people like that. I can see what they're driving at. Like my boat, but they're not, not much dancers. And stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what about Ballard? I mean, just just very quickly, because there is there is a sense. Well, of I, I would just say Ballard is a modernist writer. So leave it at that. Okay, not but the not thing. in the in the terms that we've been necessarily no, talking about no. here. But his fiction is all about a response to modernity. Actually, it's an inverted response to modernity. Because actually, what, what Ballard did do was largely get rid of character. He's only interested in characters as hieratic figures. And that's because what he believed about contemporary life. He believed, actually, that people's subjectivity wasn't that interesting. He thought they were too cold. So do I. <laughs> One more question. Um, <laughs> Um, I wanted to kind of steer us a bit away from fiction and um, we're, I'm doing an autobiography mo module at the moment and we're doing some modernist autobiographies and I wanted to ask, first of all, does the panel think that there is such a thing as a modernist autobiography and s second of all, if either of you two were to begin to write an autobiography as, let's say, modernist writers, where would you even begin? Rachel. <laughs> Is there such a thing as a modernist autobiography? Um, well, <coughs> what is an autobiography? I mean, so many. Um, I think that the, the this is probably not so true in the novel, but I mean, just like Anne Carson, for instance, who I was talking about earlier. Her work is autobiographical, her impulse is autobiographical. She, <laughs> so she said something really interesting about um, knowledge and scholarship, and so she's a great classicist and translates, you know, <laughs> Aeschylus. Um, but that, that, she felt that that was a defense against uh, 
subjectivity, and that you know, and that this was her great fear that that her autobiographical in, impulse was just a, a sort of blancmange of subjectivity if it didn't have if it, if it didn't have this sort of classical structure that that she has sort of bolted it onto. Um, so I think there is a lot of autobiography in modern writing. What would a modern autobiography be? I mean, I'm, I've sort of gone on the record too many times talking about Karl Nausgaard. I don't know if you've read Karl Nausgaard, Norwegian. No. Wrote a six-volume account. He's 46 uh, and has written these many thousands of pages uh, about his life. And um, that is it. I mean, it's modernist in the sense that he rather, as we were talking about, could not believe anymore in writing fiction. And that, that autobiography isn't... So maybe I think you need a new word. <laughs> maybe there needs to be a new word. I mean, that, I'm, I'm so quite fond of um, uh, W.G. Siebold. I don't know if you've uh, read it. So, and, and he writes these sort of quasi-autobiographical books in which you feel that, that everything that he is observing outside himself is in fact himself. And so that's another, it's a sort of dignified way of doing it. Um, I mean, one of the things that I meant to say earlier was that, I mean, just looking at the um, winners, the, short, the top three from last year, um, which I thought were really good and really interesting. Um, but just how important imitation is in your develop. I mean, that's how you learn how to do things, is by imitating other people. And it's not a bad way to learn, I think, when you're... Um, so, so I actually think maybe imitating modernist texts <laughs> as a young writer. I wish I'd done that, anyway. I wish I'd if there is a reason to. Would, would you put Proust into your modernist autobiography? Yeah, I suppose for me, the real revolution in my writing did happen when I read Proust, and that was not until I was in my 30s. And I thought, OK. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's all about permission. It's all about working out what you're allowed to do. And uh, it's really amazing how you can not know you're allowed to do certain things, even though you live in the world in 2014, you know, with loads of other people who do know you're allowed to, you know, but formative experience is so, it is such a manacle on the mind, and, and how do you, and maybe you haven't experienced that quite so much as I have, um, but I think that if I had imitated people earlier, <laughs> just done that, like someone sitting in the Louvre, for imitating whatever, um, I would have got further faster. Lady Smith always says that this was formative for her. Yeah. I mean, actually doing a kind of pastiche. Yeah. Because um, I think there's still some pretty good forms around. They're sitting around like antiques. You know, you can just use them. Why go to Ikea? You can <laughs> use the old thing. Um, sorry, I have not at all answered your question, but I don't really know how to answer it. OK. I think we're going to have to draw this to a close. I, I know we haven't answered a great many of the questions that one could raise in this area, but I, I hope it sparked some, um, I don't know, attentive interest in you. <laughs> and, and we all hope that, that there will be many, many entries to the modernism competition. I don't know whether Lara would like to have a, a final word. Okay, well, thank you very much to, oh. Go upstairs. Go upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> there are drinks upstairs, I'm sorry, I forgot about the drinks. Thank you.